My name is Robert Bader. I'm 28 years old and work for a consulting firm. I hold a master's degree in computer science. I have a height of 511. I weigh about 205 pounds, have brown hair and eyes, and stay fit by going to the gym every day and running at 5 a.m. I was told I had a lovely face. My wife's name is Ella, although she is typically referred to as Ida. She is two years younger than me, five, five, curvy, but fit. She goes to the gym around three times per week. She has blonde hair just below her shoulders, blue eyes, perfect legs, a small waist, and 34 breasts. Yes, the face is also stunningly lovely. We met at a party in college. At the time, her name was Ella Masters. She was finishing her bachelor's degree in accounting while I had already completed a year of my master's degree. We struck it off right away and dated all the way through college. We married around a year after graduating from high school. I should remark that she did not always thoroughly analyze the ramifications of her decisions. This was especially true when she had a strong belief in or desire for anything. For example, she possessed feminist tendencies, so she didn't want to simply take my name. We got married. She insisted on writing a silly hyphenated last name. You know, her maiden name followed by a hyphen before her husband's last name. Something like Scott Hewitt or Rodham Clinton. You get the idea. Whenever I tried to address this with her and tell her what a terrible idea it was, she became angry and accused me of being misogynistic and attempting to take away her individuality. She remembered previous ladies who had done this and achieved great success. She mentioned a few of her acquaintances who did this with no problems. She rants continuously about how patriarchy drives women to adopt their husband's surname in order to enslave them. I attempted to clarify that this was not the situation here. I had no intention of attempting to subdue her. Finally, I simply sat her down, hyphenated her surname, and made her read it five times. I wouldn't mind if she continued to use that name, Item Masters Beta. She abruptly dropped the notion and changed her maiden name to my last name. I told you she's naturally blonde, didn't I? So, we've been married for over five years. We didn't have children yet, but we began planning for them. We discussed getting her pregnant for our fifth anniversary, which was just over two months away. She has issues with the pill, so we always used protection when we weren't with him. We planned to do it on the night of our fifth anniversary. We'd go sans protection for the first time. This will be a memorable night for us. This brings us back to the beginning of this awful tragedy. With a beer in my hand and sat across the table from my wife, I heard five dreadful words which fueled my wrath. I just want to try something different for about a month before we have children. I need to get rid of everything before I settle down and become a mother. I attempted to explain, so let me see if I have grasped things correctly. Do you want to date other men while you are married to me? Do you want to party and sleep with other men, completely breaching your promise to leave everyone else? And you expect me to be cool with that? Are you crazy? I almost shouted the final phrase. Look, it'll only last a month or so. I need to sow the last of my oats before we can celebrate our special fifth anniversary as planned. Once this minor outbreak is resolved, I will be able to settle down and be a loving, faithful wife for the rest of my life. Not only no, but hell no, Robert. I've already made my decision. This is exactly what I need to accomplish. I am not asking for your permission. I'm only informing you in advance so I don't cheat on you. Seriously, how can I spend the night with other guys without cheating on you? It is not treason if you are aware of it and the situation is open. It's only cheating if I try to conceal it and flee behind your back. That is not the situation here. That's why I'm telling you now, before it happens. Besides, it won't happen every night. It'll probably only be Friday or Saturday night, and I'll be returning home in the morning. We'll continue to make love a couple nights a week, and I'll make sure to clean up before returning home from our outings. You'll never have to deal with sloppy seconds. I'm confident I'll never have to worry about sloppy seconds since I won't touch you after you leave. One of your first dates. Where did all your crap originate from? What in the name of all that is sacred put this foolish idea into your head? I was quite confident I understood where it came from, but I decided to inquire anyhow. Well, I told Susie about our plans to start a family. Susie, certainly. Do you mean your full-time divorced co-worker Susie? Is this the same Susie that cheated on each of her four ex-husbands? Do you really accept her marriage advice? Well, she stated I needed to clear my mind before we started a family. 
That way I could fully relax and be a wonderful mother and wife without lamenting anything I could have missed. She also mentioned that her expertise with other guys would benefit her own lovemaking by teaching me new methods to delight you. This has the potential to lead to a higher quality of life. She was overjoyed. It was quite evident that she would go through with it regardless of what I said. I tried several additional arguments but was rejected each time. Okay, it's time to pull out the big guns. It's evident that you'll go ahead with this regardless of my wishes. So, when are you planning your first date? I don't have a date yet, but Susie and I intend to go to a club tomorrow night. Okay, but I warn you that bringing anyone here would end tragically. I would never disrespect you like that. No, we'll either go to his house, his hotel room, or even return to Susie's. Fine. I am not granting such authorization and will not agree to any of it. However, it is apparent that my opinion is unrelated to your decision. In such case, I will not touch you while this occurs. Please keep in mind that this could have serious ramifications for our partnership. There may not be a place for you here if you wish to return. What exactly do you mean when I decide to return? I told you I wasn't going away. It's just one or two nights per week. We'll spend the rest of our time together. No, I will not allow this. If you are adamant about it, you leave to complete it. I do not care where you go. However, you will not live here while dating and fornicating with other men. Do not be silly. This is also my house. You cannot just kick me out. Do you remember that this house belongs to my parents? They gave it to me right before we were married. This is my house. Perhaps you should move in with Susie. It was called for the rest of the night. The next day she tried to get me to sleep in the other bedroom, but I claimed that the bed was as much my as hers. And I was planning to sleep there. If she doesn't want to sleep in the same bed as me, she can go somewhere else. We basically avoided each other. The next day, about 8 a.m., she walked downstairs in her lab stockings and garter belt. No, I couldn't see the garter belt or the top of the stockings, but I knew that look in four-inch heels. Her hair was groomed, and she wore makeup and jewelry appropriate for a night out. She just held a little clutch. Have you forgotten something? No, I've got my phone, wallet, and ID. I believe that's all I need. What about bags, clothing, cosmetics, and toiletries? I am merely leaving for the night. Why do I need all of this? I will be back before the morning. Not really. As soon as you walk out, I'll replace the locks. I told you that if you continue to insist on this nonsense, you would not be able to live here. Do not be silly. I know you love me enough to allow this. Clearly, you don't love me enough not to do it. You will not be able to return if you leave through this door. Just as she was ready to respond, a car horn sounded from the driveway. This is Susie. I have to leave, but we can discuss when I get home. What she didn't realize was that I had loaded many secret apps on her phone while she was getting ready in the bathroom. I could now follow her location, read her text messages, and record her phone calls. Hell, I could even turn on her microphone and camera without her awareness. In reality, I activated her microphone the moment she left the house. I filmed her talk with Susie as they drove. I will listen to it later. Right now, I have to work first to replace my daughter's door locks with new ones that I bought earlier in the day. Then I took her car out of the garage, programmed the garage door opener, and removed the remote control. Third, I packed all of her clothes, toiletries, and cosmetics in boxes that I had purchased in advance. Two hours later, I loaded all of her belongings into the car. Now it's time to hear her talk with Susie. God, he's mad. Okay, I warned you about this. He will be upset for about a week, but that will pass. Just make sure to completely blow his head over the next few days. Once he realizes how much better things are, he will begin to accept the situation. Men are like dogs. You can get away with anything if you compensate them appropriately. Correct. Use of women's techniques will change their perspective toward what you want. Yeah. I just hope the person you're putting me up with doesn't make me too upset to have energy. Tomorrow night will be a wonderful time with Rob. Just make sure you have a good soak in the bath tomorrow. This should alleviate any soreness. Now remove your panties and leave them in the car. You won't need them today to get them off. You first needed to put them on. You are small. They both laughed. I suppose I should describe Susie. She's a five-force terrific dynamo. She has emerald green eyes, a beautiful face, and long, fiery red hair that reaches the bumper. 38 chest, chiseled by about a million thrusts, a small waist, and the morals of a street cat driven to bliss. 
Her infidelity led to the dissolution of all four of her marriages. This was astounding considering she was only 26 years old. Seriously, who gets divorced four times before turning 30? No, I never clicked on it, but it wasn't for a lack of options. She made it very apparent that I would be welcome in her bed, any time I wanted. I should also point out that this wasn't the first time she tried to coax it into doing anything ridiculous. Usually, these were attempts to include us in a threesome or more with her. So far, I've managed to dodge this. I listened a little more, and it was impossible to listen to anything in a club until they arrived. There was just too much noise to hear any talks. Instead, I began internet banking by tracking her GP's whereabouts. I took half of the money from the checking account, paid off and canceled our shared credit cards, and moved all of our savings to an offshore account. I opened a separate account in my name a few years ago and transferred approximately 70% of our investments to it. I noticed the GPS on this phone was shifting, so I opened the microphone again. Of course, I spoke, and I overheard a strange male voice chatting to her. My phone is ringing, rustling. Hello, Susie. How are you? Hello, girl. Did you leave with the guy you were dancing with? Yes, we're heading back to your house for some alone time. I hope you don't mind if we use the spare bedroom for an hour or two. Not a problem, baby. I'll probably be there shortly with a friend. Let's have some fun. I hope I need to take a shower when we finish so I can go home later. I thought so. I left some shampoo and body wash in the spare bathroom for you. Thank you. See you later. By this point, I had turned on a camera to see if I could get a peek at the man she was with. I only caught a glimpse of it as she returned the phone to its place. It did not leave much of an effect on me. All I could tell was that guy looked to be around 30 years old. Black hair. That is thinning. And judging by his height as he seated, he was slightly shorter than me. I switched everything off while they were still driving. When I noticed that they had arrived at Susie's residence, I listened till I heard them move away from the phone. It simply won't do. I needed her phone in the same room so I could record audio evidence of her dishonesty. The video is unlikely to work. Crap. What happened? Do not pay any attention to it. I cannot. I'll talk briefly before getting rid of him. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? Where are you now? Bida and I are at Susie's. We'll just relax for a while, and then she'll drive me home. I'll be back in a few hours. We simply turned on a movie. Fine. I just wanted to make sure you didn't get in a horrible scenario. I am fine. Stop worrying. See you in a few hours. Fine. Goodbye. She must have had too much to drink because she didn't notice that when I hung up, I didn't say anything nice or tell her I loved her. She also did not comprehend when I said farewell at the end. By some miracle, she brought the phone with her into the bedroom. I believe it was because she was walking there while chatting to me. Better still, she put it on the nightstand leaning against the lamp. The camera had a good view of the majority of the bed. I'm quite confident I won't be able to utilize this in court. But at the time, I didn't care. I watched enough of the video to be certain they were having an intimate encounter. Then I minimized the window and continued recording. So, if she decided to go out and spend the night with other males, I saw no reason to sit at home and collect blue balls while waiting for her to return. You know the old adage, goose, goose, and all that crap? Screw her. I'm going to have fun in the same way. Furthermore, I plan to rub it in her face. She obviously did not return home. She needed to stay with Susie. I spent the rest of the weekend on household repairs and working on an old truck. I own a 1972 GMC pickup that I purchased on the cheap a few years ago. I've been working on it for a long now. I put a build 350 engine, a Borg Warner Super 10 four-speed manual transmission, a 12-malt rear differential, leather bucket seats, and matte black paint. All that remained was to complete connecting the steel braided lines that connected the engine to the gasoline radiator and vacuum fittings. Work kept me distracted all week, especially after I stopped communicating with either. I was able to finish the truck and prepare it for the road. I also went to a lawyer and started writing divorce documents. There was simply no way not to give her half of everything. The divorce rules in this state must have been drafted by staunch feminists. Let's face it, if you're a man, you're screwed throughout your divorce. Women scam the poor, innocent spouse who is faithful and has done nothing wrong into paying the adulteress to maintain her philandering lifestyle. A male has few options for self-defense. So, Friday evening arrived. My truck was spotless and ready for the evening after I had a shower, shaved, and applied fragrance. 
I got dressed. I wore great new Levi's pants, a black button-down shirt, and rattlesnake leather cowboy boots. It was time to pamper myself, so I headed to a good steakhouse for supper to kick off my evening. I won't bore you with the details, but the T-bone baked potato and vegetables, as well as the salad to begin, were delicious. Let's go on to the main event. As I left the restaurant, I checked to see where Ida was. Indeed. It appears that she and Susie arrived at the club around a half hour ago. It's time to put my plans into action. I had every reason to believe that this would utterly drive Ida insane. I couldn't help but smile as I parked a few spots away from Ida's vehicle. It looks like she was the designated driver today. This made my strategy a little easier because I wouldn't have to worry about Susie leaving her behind. I wasn't worried about anything myself. I was mostly concerned that if Susie drove, it would be more difficult to get her to accompany me. I entered the club with a plan in place and a backup plan in case Susie had moral concerns. They weren't difficult to detect, Susie. I didn't realize you'd be here. I remarked this as I approached their table, holding a glass. I purposefully waited till I got up so she could dance with another guy. Rob, what are you doing here? She asked cautiously. Probably the same as you, I responded. Since I just moved in, I decided to try this club and have some fun tonight. Speaking of which, do you want to dance? I should probably let you know that it has arrived with me. And how does that prevent you from dancing with me? Also, because she isn't here, I can only presume she is either in the restroom or on the dance floor by herself. Come on, you've never shied away from dancing with me before. Her anxious expression changed into a grin. Certainly, I'll be delighted to dance with you. Before the slow song, we listened to three quick tunes. I didn't offer her the opportunity to escape as soon as the music began. I drew her in and kept her tight to me for approximately a song and a half before Ida saw me. I nearly collapsed on the floor, laughing as her surprise changed to panic that I had caught her. She left the dance floor quickly after the song ended and went back to their table. Now I noticed her glaring at me with barely hidden rage. You poor thing, I haven't even begun to make you mad yet, I thought to myself. Susie hugged me passionately as we gently danced together. As I already stated, Susie is the bombshell, so it didn't take long for me to stand at attention and salute. If you understand what I mean, it didn't take long to figure out either. She gave me a broad smile and pressed herself even closer. I turned to face Ida and carefully dropped my hand to Susie's point. When the song finished, I walked Susie back to their table. She urged me to join them, and, of course, I agreed on the way back. We paused and requested the waitress to refill our drinks. As a gentleman, I asked her to put all three drinks on my tab. Robert, what the hell are you doing here? Ida hissed furiously. What do you mean? I am doing the same thing as you. I drink, dance, and have fun. Is this prohibited? Do not try to appear innocent. She spat. You're here to ruin my evening. Quite the contrary, Ida. I had no idea you would be here. Do you remember? We haven't spoken since your move. How can I know where you'll be? I learned about this group from some colleagues at work, and because you weren't there, I decided to check out this restaurant and have a wonderful night of drinking and dancing. Do you mean that this is natural for you, but not for me? Because I have to say, it is pretty hypocritical of you. With that, I turned to Susie and began speaking with her while I sat, seething with rage and attempting to ignore her. She must have intended to make me jealous because she tried to dance with as many males as possible. She began cleaning them and danced as flirtatiously as possible. I grinned to myself as I monopolized my time with Susie every time I saw another guy approach her and invite her to dance. I'd drag her onto the dance floor before they even reached the table. Everyone eventually stopped trying because it was evident that we were together. After a few hours, I realized it was time. Ida was on the dance floor, and Susie was well-prepared and accommodating. Meet me at your home, I said, breathing into her ear. Ida will get there soon. Does it matter? I'm guessing she has her own room, she said. To hell with it. She proceeded. She's driving. She can get home on her own. Let's go. I kept her tight while driving. Her dress was yanked over her head and dropped to the floor as the door closed. As soon as we entered, she grabbed my hand and basically dragged me into her bedroom. The night was great. Clearly, she had plenty of practice. I'd just hit my peak and was released. Susie wasn't paying attention when the front door slammed. Susie is also quite loud when she comes up with intimate double bonus ideas. The room is next to Susie's, separated only by a thin wall about 2 a.m. We passed out from exhaustion in the morning. 
We arrived on time again. Breakfast was awkward, to say the least. Obviously, we woke Ida up with our morning commotion. When we left, she was already in the kitchen. Coffee? Ida inquired when I entered the kitchen. Everything's fine. I'll do it myself, I said, noticing a smirk on her face as she asked. I took a clean knife from the cupboard and stood near the Keurig while she filled the cup. There's no telling what might have been in the coffee she brewed for me. After that, we had hardly little conversation. She and Susie had a brief conversation, then I spoke with Susie, who appeared to be in the club. Ida eventually realized we were both absent and connected the dots. I believe she expected me to drive Susie to my house and was outraged when she saw my truck in the parking lot. She yelled so violently that the guy she brought home for the night got back in his car and drove away. Ida stared at me like a wolf at breakfast. Soon after, I departed. When I am motivated, I can be authentic, and I was. Ida has worked with several stunning single women. I had met them several times at her firm. We held events and parties. Of course, I had their contact info. I began contacting them within the next few weeks. I convinced the majority of them to go on a date with me. Some of them were concerned since Ida and I were still married. But, as I mentioned, we had split. They softened. I started hearing that there was tension between Ida and Susie as a result of my little excursion. Tensions quickly formed between Ida and the majority of the other single women in the company. So, yeah, I began meeting Ida's acquaintances and colleagues. I shared drinks and dinner with them. I invited them to dance. I took them to shows whenever possible. I made sure to show up where Ida was, and her phone's GPS tracking software as well as the voice and video apps proved to be invaluable. I also learned that the majority of her colleagues that I met raved about their dates with me. She still went out and took men with her. She and Susie began to disagree more. I am having a terrific time. I went out, ate dinner, danced, and had an intimate encounter. I also like listening to Ida rant. This is not how things were intended to function. I wondered what you meant, said Susie. He was supposed to wait for me once I sold my final wild oats and then greet me so we could begin our family. He wasn't supposed to date or spend nights with other women. Susie was likewise perplexed. Yes, I did not expect it either. So what are you planning to do? Well, I've had my pleasure and none of the other guys can rock me like Rob. Also, our anniversary is approaching and we intend to begin working on having a kid on the night of the anniversary. Ida smiled as she remarked, He knows exactly how to send a girl into orbit. Susie understood what she was talking about. And why the hell did you bring him here and keep my husband awake all night only to pay cool down the next morning? You see, I've been yearning after him for years. What the hell was I supposed to do when he attacked me like that? He turned it up to full speed and pressed all of my buttons. I couldn't help it. But he is my husband. You may show your best friend some respect. Fine, I apologize. Look, he stopped calling me. I doubt we will ever meet again. Besides, you don't have to be furious with me. He checked on all of our single co-workers. I can't believe these co-workers are setting me up like way. It's time to reclaim what's mine. So, you're going back to him? Yes. I'll phone him later and tell him that I'm ready to return and start our family. I smiled while listening to this talk. She didn't know what would happen next. It's time to start the final phase of the plan. I called my lawyer and gave her the last instructions. There was just over a week till our anniversary, and I needed to prepare for a memorable holiday. Ida called later in the day. She wanted to go home immediately, but I refused. I informed her I had alternative plans because I didn't know what she had planned. I also informed her that I had some housework to perform and planned to surprise her when she returned home. I didn't want her to see it until it was completely finished. This will be one of her wedding anniversary gifts. I may have given a few hints that she misinterpreted as one of the bedrooms being converted into a nursery for the new baby. I never said that. Finally, I got her to come on our anniversary to get her surprise. God, will she be surprised? All preparations had been done. It was Saturday evening, and there was an anniversary party. My strategy was well underway. To celebrate, I hosted a Bobby Key and Pool party. Ida was unaware that I had installed the pool during the last two months. This was only the beginning of the surprise. We were joined by all of our friends and family, as well as a few other guests. It was approximately 6 p.m. The doorbell rang right on time. At this point, I told Ida to come. Apparently, she observed a number of automobiles in front of the home and knew we were holding a party. 
She looked astonished as she took her baggage into the house. Everything's fine. The guest of honor has arrived, I announced. Rob, what is going on? I assumed we'd go out for a quiet romantic meal tonight. She said, No, today is a major festival and I'd want to invite every one of our family and friends to join us in celebrating. I explained, Okay, sweetie, it just surprises me little. I did not expect anything like this. She responded, So simply place your suitcases here. We will take care of them later. You will arrive just in time for supper as the guest of honor. You and I will be the first in line. Ira immediately adjusted to the situation and began to enjoy himself. There has been no discussion of action in the last two months. We ate, drank, and laughed. Dinner was done and put away. There was a light turned on in the backyard. The pool and other upgrades to the house caught me off guard. I hadn't seen her the upper floor yet. She was implying that she wanted to see what I had done because she still assumed I had converted one of the bedrooms into a nursery. It was now time to reveal the last surprises. Could I have your attention, please? I have a few announcements for this great day. I yelled for everyone to calm down and listen. The stereo was turned off and everyone fell silent and moved closer to listen. Fine. Thank you for coming today. Now I have a few announcements to make. Ida, could you please come with me? I continued after she had stood next to me. First and foremost, I want everyone to know that yesterday was my last day of work. My former boss is the only person who knows about this. He was very friendly about it because I gave him months' notice and explained my plans. I am now announcing that I will be starting my own consulting company. This gives me more freedom to spend time with my family. Ida practically smiled when I emphasized the last word. As you all know, today is Ida and my fifth anniversary. What most of you don't know is that we plan to start our family on this day. Having said that, I want to give Ida a special anniversary gift to commemorate our relationship. With these words, I quietly took a couple of steps to the side and nodded to the ready-hired woman at the end of the group. She nodded in response and moved forward. Ida Batter You've been served, said the woman. What most of you don't know, I continued, is that two months ago? Ida told me that she was going to date and sleep with other men. She didn't ask if I agreed with this. She left me no choice. She just told me that she was going to do it and that there was nothing we could do about it. For the past two months, she had been living with her friend and taking different men to her home to have in time with them. This is something I simply will not put up with. To be fair, I also dated other women, but I started it after Ida had already broken her wedding vows. No, Ida screamed for your actions. I'm giving you a divorce so you can go and have intimate with whoever you want. Rest assured, it won't be me. So I told Ida that I was doing some renovations on the house. That's exactly what I did. You all saw the pool. I added and a few other things downstairs. I also repainted the master bedroom and installed a new, larger shower, as well as a jacuzzi tub in the master bath. I also ripped out the wall between the two smaller spare bedrooms to expand them into one large bedroom with its own bathroom. I did this for a very specific reason. As I was saying this, I continued the same red-haired woman in a ten-year-old red-haired girl walking towards me. I want you all to meet my lawyer, Tara Y., and her daughter. Tara is also a single mother. I met Tara two months ago on the Monday after Ida went to the club and brought her first guy. Since then, we have become very close, although we haven't officially started dating yet. We both feel like there's something between us. And I get along very well, too. Once the divorce is final and she's no longer my lawyer, we plan to be together. Her rent is up soon in Tara and at the moment are moving in with me. I turn back to Ida. So, Ida, as for what to do with your suitcases... You can take them back to your car. You won't come back here. I told you I wouldn't stand for this, but you just rushed ahead and ruined our marriage. Ida was sobbing uncontrollably. Her family screamed and shouted. Most of the friends quickly left. My family sat stunned. Tara and someone quietly went upstairs and disappeared from view. They were prepared for this reaction and agreed when I asked them if they would be okay with it. To be honest, Tara and I didn't even kiss. True. We went out to dinner and I spent a few evenings with her and Simone at their apartment. But we agreed to put everything else on hold until my divorce was final. She divorced her husband five years ago because she caught him cheating. She left the house several times after that but never felt the spark. In the end, everyone finally left. I don't know where Ida went. That same day, I deleted all the spy apps I had on her. 
I no longer cared what she was doing. Would it have been better to handle this differently? Maybe. Maybe I shouldn't have brought Tara and especially Simona into this again. Probably. Why did I do this? The simple answer is anger. I was angry at what I did. I also wanted to make sure everyone knew that I'd ruined our marriage with her selfishness. I wanted to publicly make Ida feel the pain she had caused me. She killed my love for her and made me hate her. I wanted her to feel the loss of love and the hatred it caused. Yeah, I could just serve her at work while she lived with Susie. I could just send everyone a packet with my evidence. I could have done a lot of things. I could have done a lot of things that would have been much more mature and much less painful for everyone. In the end, I did what I did. I returned to Susie. This went on for about two weeks before they were at each other's throats. Eventually, she got her own small apartment. I often see her in the city. Her facial expression when she sees me alternates between sadness and anger. I think it depends on her mood. We don't exchange pleasantries. I actually heard from one of her colleagues that she left the company and found a new job. The stress of me dating so many other women she had to work with became too much for her. I also see her family sometimes. When Tara, Simon, and I are having dinner again, we don't talk, but they frown at us. We just ignore it. Speaking of Tara and Samoan, I too tried to fight the divorce, but soon realized that it was a hopeless matter. Wanting everything to end quickly, Tara allowed me to increase the pressure on Ida by continuing to meet Ida's colleagues. Ida signed the papers after she heard a glowing report about our night together with her colleague on the of my fourth date at work, the day the documents officially dissolving my marriage arrived. Tara and Simone moved in with me a year later. Tara and I got married. Another year later, we met Ida while Tara, Simon, and I were wandering around a street fair. Ida turned, ran away, sobbing when she saw Tara's six-month pregnant belly. Here's the next story. Surprised? Although Valerie was stunned by this answer, she really couldn't say that she was surprised by her husband's lack of jealousy. In fairness to Dean, his lack of jealousy has always been something of a blessing. Valerie was the kind of woman who attracted attention. Standing just under five foot ten inches tall, she had what could be conservatively described as a feminine figure. Dean always joked that their first meeting was all about chest legs, fifth point, and then face. Since that was the order in which she caught his attention walking around her desk to greet him as he was ushered into her office. Now, at the age of 29, the brunette secretly felt that she looked better than she did at 19. Her chest showed just the hottest hint of sagging. The waist was narrow, in the stomach was flat, leading to rounded hips, which spoke more of a beautiful woman than a pretty girl. The legs, although slender, were muscular and athletic, completing an ensemble that would make most men feel a little out of place. And here she was telling her husband about the young cashier who was hitting on her. And not only was Dan not jealous, but he even asked her to take him on a coffee date. In truth, Val was a little annoyed. Dean did know the cashier who was hitting on her, or at least knew who she was talking about. He could at least pretend to be a little jealous, even if he was just doing it as a compliment to her. Maybe I should mention that he also works out at my gym, she thought to herself. But that caused another bout of indignation. There was a time when Dean trained with her, but these days he did kickboxing for fun, which was another thing she just didn't understand. How could you relax from getting hit in the face? I'm serious. Go if you want. It could be fun. Valerie chose to ignore his words quickly, leaving the office. Jerk. She thought to herself, stomping into her studio. She had never even considered the possibility of cheating, but she couldn't help wondering how Dean's encouragement should actually be understood. Someone must have been bashing his thick skull with a baseball bat, knocking all the sanity out of his pea-sized brain on Friday morning. Valerie was lifting weights in the gym this morning as she was getting ready to go to the gym. Dean announced that he would be out of town for the weekend as he was going to help some kickboxing club fighters at a national tournament. No warnings, no discussions. Just, I won't be here, she hissed, tensing her hands shaking from fatigue. I hope you weren't talking to me. Said a voice followed by a disarming smile and blue eyes. Not for you, Valerie grumbled, lowering the barbell to her chest. That was the last thing she needed. A boy from the store. Push, Ralph said lightly, helping her do another repetition, arching her back with effort. Valerie felt a burning sensation in her arms as she lifted the barbell up for the last time, stretching her arms up. She felt Ralph place the barbell on the racks, feeling that the bar was securely fastened. 
She let go and sat up, grabbing a towel to wipe the sweat from her face and chest. Could you help me? asked Ralph, pushing new weights for her barbell. Of course, she said, becoming even more irritated by his impudence and interfering with her training regimen. Settling down on the bench, the 18-year-old quickly got into position and began performing warm-up reps with effortless grace. When he was finished, he removed several dumbbells from the barbell, adjusting the weight to better suit Valerie. With a smile, he motioned for her to take a seat on the bench. She reluctantly complied, looking up as she grabbed the bar. Val couldn't help but notice a bulge not too high above her face. The young man seemed to have a lot of big muscles ready. Valerie nodded, sure that he had noticed her look and angry at herself for it. The little pervert probably took that look as an invitation to harass her further, lower the bar, lower. That will give you the best effect, Ralph said as she completed the first rep. On the second rep, she did it while feeling the bar touch her chest. By the sixth repetition, her hands were on fire. But there was something else. She felt an unpleasant warmth from the intimacy of the situation with each rep. As she lowered the barbell to her chest, Ralph's hand made contact with her cleavage as he helped hold the barbell with one hand. Good job. Three left, said Ralph, switching to a two-handed grip of the barbell. He thinks I can't do this, she thought to herself. But something else stirred in her head when she lowered the bar. She could have easily stopped the rep midway. Something made her lower the bar all the way, allowing his fingers to touch the swell of her chest. Her face contorted in concentration. She was a stunning sight to her training partner as she removed the barbell in his hands from her chest. Her bosom were slick with sweat, and when she arched her back, the tight spandex did not hide the outline of her nipples, let alone the bulge of her crotch below. His muscles were also moving. Ten minutes later, they performed their final set of bench presses, as she was about to dry herself off. Val caught Ralph's eye. He seemed embarrassed. You just look so good, wet and all. I was hoping you'd stop drying yourself all the time. Suddenly there was electricity in the air. Val was angry, but at the same time there was something else. A kind of animation. She wiped her face slowly, collecting her thoughts, and then lowered the towel. The last set is yours, Ralph, she said firmly. He quickly got into position and started pumping out reps. Three, four, five, six. The muscles tensed and writhed, almost hypnotizing her. He was very interesting to watch. When he finished, he sat down, breathing deeply, but evenly turning to her, he asked, Now I need to do some squats. Will you join me? I don't think so, Val answered quickly, not even allowing herself to think about the possibilities of such a situation. I'll spin around a little and then leave, okay? Said Ralph, clearly disappointed. But call if you ever need help. I'll do so. Val smiled. Thanks for your help this morning. He probably liked it even more. She thought to herself, wondering why she even said that. Knowing that it would serve as motivation for him to continue pursuing her, the boy perked up noticeably as she turned and walked towards the stationary bikes. I do this because I like attention, she answered herself but she tried to push these thoughts aside, hide them and not think about them further. Having chosen her itinerary, Val settled into a steady rhythm and almost immediately found herself breaking her new vow as she reflected on the last 15 minutes. In truth, the situation turned her on. That forbidden flirtation made her pulse quicken and her juices began to flow like a river. The nipples were like springy walnuts, and if she decided to squat with Ralph, it would become dangerously intimate. As images flashed through her mind, she strained herself to the limit, trying to block them. Unfortunately, this didn't work at all, as the rush of blood combined with the friction from the seat only seemed to make her problems worse. Knowing that he was there and being all too aware of the looks he kept giving her as he walked around the gym made everything more problematic. She wanted to jump off her bike and rush into the sauna where she would quickly fall into nirvana. Well, it was the second best option. What the hell am I doing? She thought angrily to herself. It wasn't like her at all. She couldn't believe that a combination of exercise and a few innocent touches could bring her to such a state. Damn you, Dean, she hissed. It's your fault. Finally, fearing the beep, Val began to slow down, giving her body a chance to properly cool down. Watching Ralph, she knew that he had noticed everything. 
He seemed to hesitate aimlessly, but she could see the little gears turning in his head as he gathered his reserves. This is it, she chuckled to herself as he approached her. Sorry, Val, I don't mean to be pushy or anything. He seemed out of breath, but then continued. I know you're married and all, but I hope that if you don't, you might want to go somewhere with me. Val thoughtfully studied his face, looking for something indefinable. He was right. She was married, but she also did nothing this weekend thanks to her husband going on a brainwashing expedition. I mean, you can come with your husband if you want. Ralph stammered his face, red. Val managed to stop herself from laughing, but couldn't suppress her smile. God, am I making a complete fifth point of myself? He grinned, trying to hide his embarrassment. Val softened. Not hopeless. In fact, maybe not hopeless at all. What did you mean by asking me out? Ralph seemed to have regained some composure. How about a movie and dinner? Sounds tempting, Val said, sliding off the bike. You can pick me up at 7, 353 Mountain View Drive. As she walked towards the locker room, she couldn't believe what she had just done. Dan wanted me to be adventurous, and now I'm granting the wish. No, I'm not like that, she convinced herself. All I do is not sit at home waiting to serve at the beck and call of His Grace, the Duke of Absence. But does this make me the Duchess of Temperance? What about my reaction to Ralph's help with the bench press and the fact that I didn't wipe the sweat off my chest? What was that? That evening, at a quarter to seven, Ralph was at the gate. Val was nervous about opening the door, but not nearly as nervous as Ralph seemed. He seemed ready to run away at the first sign of trouble, trouble that Ralph feared. She suspected for fear of the reaction of her angry husband. He obviously put a lot of effort into looking his best, and he did it very well, shyly polite. His well-muscled, six-foot, three-inch frame was also ten years her junior. Again, she wondered what exactly she was doing. What was her goal in this adventure? She didn't intend for anything to happen between them. She was sure of that. But why was she trying so hard to look her best? And why did she have butterflies in her stomach? Returning home early, she spent almost two hours getting ready. She showered and shaved her legs, but it wasn't anywhere near being on display. No man other than her husband had ever seen her without clothes, and that wouldn't change. She chose then lacy black underwear, the kind that instantly gave Dean a hard on the black and white miniskirt and matching blouse showed off her figure perfectly, and the zipper on the front of the blouse provided easy access to her chest, something she hadn't really thought about. High-heeled sandals left the legs bare and showed them off at their best. She looked fantastic, and she knew it. She felt another pang of foreboding, but now it was too late to back out. Even if she wanted to for any reason, she decided that she would enjoy the walk, and he would enjoy the thrill of finally getting his date at the end of the night. She would easily send him away, but hopefully he would understand everything before then. I'll grab my things, and then we can hit the road. Ralph seemed to feel much more at ease as they climbed into his little Toyota and set off. By the time they reached the shopping center near her home, they were chatting like old friends. He told her that he had bought movie tickets. He didn't know what her taste was, so he hoped she would approve of his choice. She also caught the sneaking glances he gave her and enjoyed every moment of his admiration although she had no intention of showing it. Once inside, Ralph suggested they get something to drink before the session, so they ended up ordering milkshakes from one of the ice cream parlors. Val also noticed how much attention they were getting. At first, she put it down to the age difference, but then she came to believe that the attention was not judgmental, but due to the fact that they were a striking couple by the time they entered the theater. She knew that he didn't currently have a girlfriend, what his career intentions were, and all those other things that were usually shared on a first date as they settled into their seats. She wondered where such conversations with Dave had gone. Once upon a time, she and Dave shared their dreams too. Now they were constantly busy trying to survive until the next month. It was a sad condemnation of modern life as the lights dimmed and the commercials began. Ralph leaned over to her from time to time to whisper some inconsequential phrase, something she hoped he would stop doing once the movie started, as it always irritated her. Fortunately, he did just that a few minutes into the movie. She noticed that he was nervous. 
She also realized that she was paying more attention to his anxiety than to the screen. She almost burst out laughing when she realized what the problem was, a problem she had last encountered at the age of 16. He was trying to figure out how to take her hand without losing a few teeth. Val actually felt a pang of sympathy for him. He was young and she was essentially using him for her own amusement, either to get back at Dave or to bolster her flagging ego. Whichever option she preferred, Dean had always told her that being a hunter was not as easy as women thought. And as she watched Ralph go out of his way, she couldn't help but feel sorry for the young man. But no matter how much she pitied him, it was a bet he had made, and he had to lie in it. He wanted to take a chance and date a married woman, so he had to deal with the consequences. Any further help from her would only create an uncomfortable situation later, leaving him alone with his plight. Val tried to focus on the movie, but she couldn't. Ralph made a big deal out of it. It took him a full 45 minutes to finally get hand-to-hand -hand contact. Val also found herself in a difficult position. On the one hand, she wanted to get out of this situation immediately. It was dangerous. On the other hand, she had to admit that she was flattered by the attention and more than a little angry at Dan. He was the one who invited her to continue this adventure. It was he who wanted to blame it on some boxing tournament, instead of being here and doing homework. Ralph gently took her hand, the moment of truth. Val left her hand where it was, no harm, no foul. That was all that could happen. She would see to it. Gradually, the beating of her heart subsided and she returned her attention to the screen, all too aware of the power of the big young hands which were now woven into her hand. These fingers were long and thick. As the credits rolled and the lights came up, the usual stampede began on the way to the doors. Val and Ralph waited patiently for their turn to join the stream, heading for the exit. Stepping into the human river, Ralph stood in front of her again, taking her hands so that they would not be separated. Politely, but firmly, he moved through the crowd, parting it like an icebreaker on its way to an arctic base. Val had to admit that she loved being taken care of like that. It wasn't that Dave didn't care about her. It was more a matter of respecting independence and something lost in the marriage. It had been a while since she'd been the center of this kind of attention. Not that it was Denise's fault. It was just the way things seemed to work out when you'd been married for a while. Right now, Ralph was making her feel special. He made her feel vulnerable, small, and all those other things that gave her a warm feeling she hadn't felt in a while. And she enjoyed it. In addition, nothing reprehensible had happened so far and would not happen later. She was in control of the situation, and if he started to frolic, she would immediately deal with him on the street. Ralph did not let go of her hand. Instead, he led her in the direction of a restaurant where he had apparently made a reservation. Val smiled slightly at his newfound confidence. She doubted he was making any assumptions. He didn't seem like that. It was probably more of a sense of achievement and chivalry. Besides, it didn't hurt that she could handle this shy 18-year-old guy if he was so inspired just holding her hand. He could have been destroyed just as easily. Besides, she was enjoying the adventure, too. Did she really admit it? With a mental shrug, she put it aside. The fact is that she liked to walk through this crowd holding the hand of this young stallion at the risk of seeing someone she knew. It was Friday night, and since the complex was so close to home, there might be people there who would know she was hanging around with the guy. Maybe this was the excitement. Dan wanted her to feel she had forgotten what it felt like to be excited to be in someone's company. And she vowed that at the end of the evening, she would thank Ralph for it and bring it back into her marriage. Settling into a corner booth at the cute little restaurant she'd only visited once, Val decided she wasn't mad at Dean anymore. In all likelihood, she should have apologized to him. To be fair, she should take most of the blame for the deterioration of their relationship. She was boring, not him. He was at least trying to stimulate their marriage. That's why she was here. But she'd be damned if she was going to admit it to him. The best he could get from her was a ceasefire. Satisfied with this decision, she sat back to enjoy the rest of the evening. Ralph was a nice guy. She hoped he wouldn't take it too personally, that things had gone this far. An hour later, Val had to admit that she was enjoying herself more than she had expected. Ralph was a good conversationalist and had a peculiar sense of humor. Sitting at right angles to each other at such a small table, 
They were close enough to each other to discuss anything without fear of being eavesdropped. This closeness also made accidental touching inevitable, so it had to be treated as such. The food was amazing. They started with wine, looked over the menu, and then ordered appetizers. Unlike most restaurant meals, the pace of the evening was leisurely. They didn't even consider the options for their main course until the leftover appetizers. Hours were cleared away, and the same for dessert. By the time the waitress cleared away the empty plates for dessert, Val was feeling a distinct buzz thanks to the glass of wine that had somehow remained full all evening. She was an occasional drinker at best, and right now she was slightly over her usual two-drink maximum. Prudence would advise refraining from such excesses on the first date, especially in the company of a young man who wanted to get into her pants. She liked Ralph's careful advances, the touch of his leg against hers under the table, and the occasional touches during conversation. If she weren't married, she would probably be more than interested. Despite his age and subsequent lack of experience, which would be against him if she thought he was dangerous, she wouldn't have done it. But he was really nice, and he was the perfect gentleman throughout the evening. She made it clear that she was happily married and had no intention of cheating on her husband. It was just an outing with a friend, and he was very nice about it. So Val decided to flirt a little by letting him peek at her cleavage as she leaned forward to say something, or allowing a touch to linger a moment longer than necessary. As for Ralph, he did not seem to feel intoxicated at all, except that all signs of his nervousness had disappeared. He was smart, funny, and very charming. He also liked word games and hints, and they did this all evening. She seems very interested in you, Val remarked when the waitress, having put down their lures, disappeared to the back to prepare the bill. The waitress had to like eyes. This won't help her at all. Ralph smiled. She has no chance, and she knows it. She can never compare to you. Smile a compliment. Smile. Gratitude. When the bill arrived, Val pulled it towards her. No, you don't understand, Ralph said, his hand covering hers. This is my treat. I really liked your company. And it was I who asked you to meet. If you remember, Val couldn't help but laugh at that. I remember. But you were very convincing. However, I don't mean to offend you, but my budget can handle this better than yours. So let me do my part. You're a sweet lady. He smiled. But my young ego could never handle it. I'll tell you what, you can make us some coffee and we'll be done with this. You win, she admitted, enjoying the slight mutual banter after paying the bill. They headed to the door. This time Val didn't even think about refusing Ralph's proposed hand. At least it helped hide the slight hesitation in her gait. It was much quieter outside, walking slowly past the closed shops of the shopping center. They admired the display cases, stopping from time to time to look at something. Val wasn't sure at what point Ralph hugged her, but when they entered the parking lot, she had her arm around his waist and he had his arm around her shoulders. Walking up to the car, he opened the door for her. Thank you, Val. It really was a great evening. Even if you only agreed to this to get rid of me, it's not true, Val replied playfully, turning to face him, at least not completely. I enjoyed it too. Suddenly standing, facing each other in the twilight in the air, felt electricity looking into his eyes. Val felt a slight shiver run down her spine as she suddenly realized the inevitability. She should never have let it come to this. But Ralph had already leaned forward and lightly brushed his lips against hers. Thanks anyway. He smiled, leading her into the car in stunned silence. The trip home was uneventful and calm. Val's thoughts were racing. There she got into trouble and was let off the hook because he was a gentleman. How did she feel about this? Part of her was furious. She realized with horror. Part of her wanted Ralph to do something more, needed reassurance that she was still wanted. Nonsense, said another quiet voice. But she couldn't deny the exhilaration she felt throughout the evening. All day long as she looked forward to the evening. She'll have something to ponder about when Ralph drops her off at home. Once she reached to her house, Valerie used the remote control to unlock the gate, and Ralph drove up to the front door, turning off the motor. He jumped out and opened her door, walking towards the door. Val was thinking about how she was going to spend her goodbyes. When Ralph commented on how badly he needed a cup of coffee, I probably drank a little more wine than usual, he laughed. But that's your fault. You were such lovely company. Val slowed down. 
It would have been courteous to say no, and she seemed to give him a cup of coffee in a restaurant. Or did he assume she had consented to a cup? It didn't really matter. She couldn't remove herself gracefully at this point, and he didn't deserve to fight back just because she couldn't create and enforce boundaries. Well, then I must prepare some nice coffee, don't you think? She answered. Ralph followed Val into the kitchen, taking a seat in the breakfast nook as she made coffee. She rarely drank instant coffee, preferring to grind the beans immediately before putting the coffee in the coffee maker. As she moved around the kitchen, she was well aware that Ralph's eyes were watching her every move. They had not exchanged a word since they entered the house, and she felt as the tension built again. Val felt better than she had in a long time. Standing on her tiptoes to reach for something, she felt her calf muscles contract and positioned herself so that he could enjoy the spectacle. Turning to profile, she knew he couldn't help but notice the size of her bosom and the firmness of her fifth point. What shocked her was that she wanted to show herself off like this. She was enjoying his attention. What the hell are you trying to do? A soft voice warned. But she had long since stopped listening to silent voices. After finishing the coffee, she was thoroughly enjoying the moment. She waited until the coffee machine started to grumble. Looking into the darkness beyond the window, she noticed movement in the glass's reflection. Ralph rose from his chair. Val's heart rate increased dramatically. She understood exactly what was going on, and she knew it was what she had wanted all day, from the minute they started bench-pressing this morning until she saw him draw closer to her. But now that the moment had arrived, she was afraid. She froze as his figure approached from behind. The contact of his hands on her forearms drove lightning through her, yet she did not turn and wave away. He began gently stroking her arms, bringing her closer to his own warmth. He buried his nose in her neck and said, If you don't want this, tell me right away. We shouldn't do this, she whispered gently, arching her back slightly. That isn't the question I asked you? Ralph answered by hugging her. Val didn't respond. He held her in that position for a bit before kissing her neck again. He slowly drew her head back exposing her neck and jawline while putting small kisses closer to her lips. The first kiss swept across her lips like a butterfly, igniting a passion she recognized. Since he took her hand at the movie theater, things have gotten out of control. Ralph gently pulled her head against his chest and kissed her tenderly. Valerie felt his muscular chest press against her back, his hot tongue scorch her mouth, and his hands begin to explore her body as they slid down her arms and to her hips. Ralph's hands explored her stomach, and she could tell he was eager as well. She arched her back even more, forcing her buttocks firmly on his. In response, he raised his hands gradually, and for the first time, she felt those strong young hands cup her chest. Now he was on a roll. He waited for a few minutes before reaching for the zipper on the front of her blouse and slowly and carefully tugging it down. She panicked for a brief period, knowing that no one but Dean had ever undressed her. But Ralph had his hands on her shoulders again, silencing her as his mouth devoured her neck. Relaxing her hands, she felt him remove her top, and then his hands slipped down to cup her breasts, carrying her bra with them. They had tremendous feelings towards each other. Ralph's hands returned to her shoulders, causing her to turn to face him. He pulled her in for a hard kiss, locking his arms around her neck. Val had never felt better about an out-of-control scenario. Her rushing heart calmed, and Valerie smiled at him, grateful that he had pulled a brilliant joke on her to which she readily consented. It was too late to change his decision, and he deserved a proper reward for his efforts. She could tell from his eyes that he understood exactly what she wanted right now. Val felt fully alive. Is this what you wanted? Val could not argue. Yes, he responded simply, and I will never forget it, and I will always respect it wholeheartedly. She recognized that this was merely the beginning of an irreversible and dismal journey toward unfathomable, uncertain joy. He sucked her in like a whirlpool. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed the story, please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you have a story to tell me about your own or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.